Sorry for the delay. So uh, thanks for, to the organizers for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here. We already had an exciting week last week with uh, several tutorials. Um, so in my talk today, I would kind of also follow up on the tutorials I gave, and I would like to talk about, well, two-dimensional systems and systems exhibiting topological order, about which we already heard in the previous talk. Um, and I would in particular like to, to, to give a perspective from the view of entanglement theory on systems which exhibit topological order. And, hmm, ah, works. Okay, so um, what kind of systems are we interested in? Well, we're interested in systems consisting of many constituents, complex quantum systems with strong quantum interactions, strong correlations, in a way where these interactions between the constituents play an important role to understand their physics. So entanglement becomes very important, and that's where quantum information theory enters, which has given us a whole framework of kind of dealing with systems which exhibit entanglement, ways to understand entanglement, quantify it, do useful things with it, and so on. And so what we would like to do is we would like to, probably too far for the signal of the remote. Um, what we would like to do is to study these kind of systems from a point of view of entanglement theory, kind of looking at, at their entanglement, asking what's special about their entanglement and how we can use this to address, to study the physics of these systems. So the type of systems I would like to focus on in my talk, just to mention very briefly, are spin systems, something which is very familiar to people in quantum information, of course, it's just, well, finite level systems sitting on some lattice, interacting via some local interactions. And that's actually a kind of system, of course, nature is not built of spins, and it's also not built of lattices as such, but it's an effective model which shows up in many scenarios, so we can have crystal lattices where localized electrons give magnetic moments, and the magnetic physics is described that way. We could also have bands which form mod insulators because they're half filled and exhibit that physics. Or, like in, in Christian's talk, we could have optical lattices which we build in the lab where we simulate that kind of physics. So there's a wide range of regimes where these systems actually appear. And the kind of physics we're interested in here is most of the physics at low temperatures. In particular, we'll be thinking about ground states and the excitations on top of the ground states. And one particular reason is that these systems ex exhibit most entanglement. So we expect, expect they exhibit the most unconventional physics. Because we know in quantum information, as we raise the temperature of a system, it gets less and less entangled, so it should become more and more classical. So um, before I kind of say what's special about these entangled systems, let me juxtapose them to what one might call conventional matter, so systems which don't exhibit strong entanglement. And we could think, for instance, of a magnetic system where the, the magnets would like to align in parallel, a ferromagnetic system. And either we could change the temperature, and depending on the temperature, the magnets will either align in parallel or they will become disordered. Or we could have, say, in a ground state problem like we would like to consider in this talk, we could put a transverse field, which has a very similar effect. If the field is large, the spins will align along the field. If it's small, they will all align in parallel and not along the field in some random direction. And this can be detected by some order parameter, some local order parameter. So we can look at a single spin and ask, does a spin align in a way which breaks the symmetry of the interactions? And if it does, we say it's symmetry breaking. If it doesn't, it's symmetric. And this way, we can classify quantum phases um, based kind of on the assumption that there are negligible uh, uh, correlations, negligible entanglement. So we can describe, understand the physics by basically making a product state ansatz, which allows us to characterize its behavior just by describing what a single spin does. So quantum matter is something which doesn't behave like that, which doesn't behave like, well, Landau theory, which is based on this kind of existence of a local order parameter. So for instance, these systems can exhibit degenerate ground states, which are not distinguished by a local order parameter, which cannot happen in the previous case. All the different ground states, spins pointing in different directions in parallel, are labeled by a different value of the magnetization of a single spin. So that's very unconventional that these states cannot be distinguished. They also exhibit excitations, which, say, on a spin system can show fermionic or even more complex behavior, which is something which we cannot expect to show up in a system which is just described by a product state where excitations are just single spin flips, basically. And they will also exhibit very special physics at their edge, which cannot be understood as a purely one-dimensional physics. It requires the existence of non-trivial entanglement in the bulk. And all these things are something well, one important point, of course, for, from a quantum information point of view to point out is because there does not exist a local order parameter which can distinguish different ground states of such a system, these states are also intrinsically robust to any kind of local noise because local noise is just also a specific way of locally looking at the system. If they all look identical, noise cannot kind of destroy a superposition of those states, which makes them interesting candidates for topological quantum memories. 
And well, there is no local in, uh, order parameter, but still, still there must be some ordering because well, there's, there's more than one state. Some kind of structure, some symmetry must be broken. So it must be some ordering in the global entanglement pattern. And that's why these phases due to the global topological behavior are termed topological phases. So what we would like to do now is we would like to understand how this global entanglement in these states can be maybe reconciled with a local description because well, the local description of mean field theory, of Landau theory has turned out extremely powerful in the last whatever 80 years or so. Um, so is there a way to reconcile this? And for that we should look at the entanglement of these states and ask what makes the entanglement of these states special. And so what is special about the entanglement of these states? Well, if we look at a ground state of such a many body system, and we cut, it's a pure state, right? It's a ground state. We cut out an area and we ask how big, how large is the entanglement of, of that region with the rest of the system? What we find is that this entanglement scales like the boundary of that region, like the length of the boundary, not like the degrees of freedom in the, in the bulk, which for a random state would be a very, very untypical behavior. So these states are very, very special. So out of this big Hilbert space in which these many body states live, there's actually a very small area which is singled out by its special entanglement structure where these states reside. And kind of the cartoon picture would be that basically only states around this boundary, around this cut, are entangled. Everything else is not entangled. So all degrees of freedom here are not entangled with the outside. And now what we would like to do is to make some kind of ansatz for such a state based on this understanding of the entanglement. But of course, we would like to do it in an isotropic way. This kind of only satisfies us in a specific cut. We would like to have this in all possible cuts. So the way we do it is as follows. One could think it's inspired of mean field theory. In mean field theory, we just have a state which is a tensor product of individual states. So it's just characterized by a vector, by a bunch of numbers attached to each of the spins. And each is described by the same vector. What we do now is that to each side, we don't associate a vector. We associate a tensor. And this tensor will have five indices on a square lattice. One index corresponding to what we had here is a deep possible physical states. But additional four auxiliary indices, or virtual indices, which are used to build up correlations. And what we do then, we build a grid of these states. And the idea is that whenever on this grid we connect two legs, it means that we identify the index, like the gamma here, for instance, and sum over it. So what we do that way is we identify adjacent virtual indices and sum over them. And the summing builds up correlations. It's a way of building up correlations. And in a formal way, what we did is we took this expansion coefficient and we express this expansion coefficient as a big sum of, well, fairly simple tensors. We have one complicated coefficient. We express it as a sum over many simpler coefficients, um, which is indeed a generalization of what happens in mean field, where this is just a product of numbers. Here's just a contraction of tensors. And so that's why these states are known as tensor network states, or also projected entangled pair states. I won't explain why they're called like that. Um, and the idea is really that this tensor has a physical degree of freedom plus extra degrees of freedom to build up the entanglement. So just by this construction, you can immediately see that it's a very natural generalization of mean fields. So it does generalize mean field, this projected entangled pair or PEPS ansatz. But it also turns out, and that's kind of remarkable, it's not a perturbative generalization of mean field, but we can already on the lowest non-trivial level, where this auxiliary index, each of them has two possible settings, we already can describe non-trivial topological models. And indeed, we, it turns out we can describe all uh, non-chiral topological models that way, for instance. We can also associate these guys to Hamiltonians. We can use them to build solvable models where we also have a Hamiltonian and a ground state wave function. And we can generalize this to go beyond spin systems, to go to fermionic systems, systems with chiral order, with continuous theories, and so forth. Another thing, so this, this, this tells us that certain types of, of phases of wave functions can be modeled exactly. But conversely, these states are also very well suited to generally approximate the low energy physics of systems with local interactions. And well, there are several ways of proving it, but the intuitive way goes by saying that in order to get a low energy or grounds, that we can do some imaginary time evolution to cool. And this cooling we can, in a quantum formation way, maybe implement by using up some entanglement. But we don't need much if we do many small totter steps. So then one can basically take these guys and compress all the entanglement used and do this with a very low amount of, or relatively low amount of entanglement. That's kind of the intuition. 
So because they approximate these states well, this, these states form a basis for very powerful numerical methods, for instance. That's something which I also explained in one dimension of the tutorials last week, for instance. All right. So there are several things we can do with uh, these class of tensor network states, or PEPs. Well, we can use them for very mathematical things like classifying phases, looking at the structure of the entanglement in the system as, as given by these tensors. We can use it to, to build models to study the specific, of, uh, the specific physics of specific systems by setting up some model wave function. And we can do full variational simulations like density matrix normalization group. And in my talk, I would like to focus on these two aspects here. And so how can we use these tensor network states to classify phases? Well, one relevant question is how can we encode physical symmetries we have in a system? And it turns out that in tensor networks, generally the idea is that symmetries can be encoded locally. So one direction is fairly easy to see. If I act with some physical symmetry on the physical degree of freedom, and the tensor has this property that it translates this action to some different action on the entanglement, on the virtual degrees of freedom, and then I build up a network of these guys. Once you build a network, you see that on every leg you have one VG and one VG dagger. If that's a unitary, it will cancel. So I will get a symmetric wave function that way. Now it turns out that, for instance, in one dimension, but also under certain conditions in two dimensions, the opposite also holds. So whenever I want to study the physics of a symmetric wave function, I can do it locally. There is a way to encode this property locally, despite the global entanglement in that wave function. And actually getting a full understanding of the reverse relation is still an open question. Um, like what are the conditions when I, when I can encode this locally? What's the most general way of doing so? And these symmetries also show up in the Hamiltonian to which this is a, a ground state. So we really can use it to study the, the physics of phases of systems under symmetries. And one thing one can do, for instance, is to do this in one dimension. Where for instance, if you have a spin one chain like the Haldane chain we heard about already today, in the Haldane chain, what we have is that a physical spin one action translates into two spin one half actions at the boundary. And it turns out that this is very, so there are two possibilities to satisfy this equation. We could have integer or half integer spins. And these are two completely inequivalent ways of building spin chains. So one can use this to classify the structure of these chains, of these one dimensional chains, chains under say spin one symmetry in one dimension. But I would like to focus on two dimensions and specifically on topological order. So the question is, is there also a way to not only encode physical symmetries, but to also encode topological order in some local way? And it turns out this is indeed the case. It's actually very resemblant, if you just keep this in mind for one second, to, it's very resemblant to that. So what we have now, in the, in the simplest case, I go by example, in the simplest case in two dimensions, we have a very similar symmetry. So we have that the tensor is invariant under the action of some symmetry like Z2, that's a Pauli Z matrix here, on the entanglement degrees of freedom alone. So before we had to act with a sym physical symmetry to get this equation, now we don't have to do this. So it's not related to having a physical symmetry, it's just related to having some structure in the entanglement degrees of freedom in the system. And let me try to, to explain you why, like, why this, this allows to understand topological order, and it actually allows to understand many aspects in kind of a unified way. And to understand this, it's actually very helpful to take this equation and move two of these z's to the left side, say these two. So now we can think that what we have is kind of an imagined line of things, so these z's are kind of lined up. And what I do is I take this line and I push it to the other side of this tensor. First it goes above, now it goes below. And one can indeed make a more general formulation of that. So there's a very general formulation in terms of other tensors, which form some tensor network, which can be pulled through. And it turns out this general formulation really allows to describe all non-chiral topological phases. But why is this property useful? The basic insight is that this property is useful because we can build up long strings of these z's running through our system. Just think of a well, infinitely long string. And then we can use this equation to say take this part and move it to the other side and we can continu continue doing so. So we can make strings of objects in our system and the, the location of the string is kind of floating. These strings are not localized objects, they're actually freely floating objects. So why is this important? How is this related to topological order? Well, the point is that what we can do, for instance, if we wrap our system on a, on a torus with periodic boundary conditions, we can put horizontal and vertical strings of these z's, so this g and h can be either nothing or a z, around the torus. And now what you see is that, well, 
these strings don't go away, right? So the state should be inequivalent whether we put a string or not. But where we put the string should be completely irrelevant because as I told you, these strings are really floating. They could be anywhere. So in particular, this means if I'm trying to check anywhere locally to see if there is such a string, I won't be able to see the string, right? So these states are indistinguishable locally, but it turns out one can actually prove they're globally different. So this really allows to label these different states. It also allows us to construct excitations which naturally come in pairs just by building long strings, but strings which have endpoints. Because again, these strings can be freely moved, but the endpoints can't, right? Because they don't satisfy this equation. So we have excitations which naturally come in pairs, and it turns out we can put some dual excitation, like a Pauli X, which anti-commutes a string. And if we move one around the other, it's like commuting an X with a Z. We get a minus one. So there's some mutual fermionic statistics in the system, despite the fact that it's actually just a spin system where we started from. So this really allows us to model the, the ground space structure of the system and also the excitations, both analytically, but also numerically, because this also works for systems with finite correlation length. We're actually writing down a physical operator to create an excitation is very complicated. All right, so one thing is the symmetry allows us to understand the origin of the indistinguishable ground states and of these excitations which come in pairs and have non-trivial statistics. It also allows us to understand special signatures in the entanglement structure of topological systems. And the reason is that if we start well with something which has a symmetry, which is invariant under the action of Pauli Zs, again, if we make a larger patch, all the interior Zs cancel because we have Zs on, appearing twice on each link. So we have that each big patch, again, is invariant under Pauli Z action, which means it lives on the even parity subspace only, right? This thing is only supported on the even parity subspace. That's what it tells us. And this allows us to understand quite a few special things about the entanglement. So for instance, one thing one can show is that if we want to know, if, so, so, so I told you we can write on Hamiltonians for these systems. So we can take these Hamiltonians on an open boundary condition patch and ask what's the physics, like is there some special physics around the edge, right? Because we cut the system somewhere. And well, what one can show is that basically just by choosing different boundary conditions here, we can exactly parameterize the space of edge, of edge modes, right, of the excitations which live close by the edge. However, now only degrees of freedom which have an even parity are admissible, so the whole edge physics is constrained to a subspace which, which conserves parity, which means that there is basically some, some, some uh, if you wish, fermionic constraint in the specific case showing up, some anomaly, some constraint which is not natural to the spin system, but it comes from the entanglement structure of that state. So there's some topological signature in the behavior of the edge in the sense that it must obey a parity constraint. We can also look at the entanglement uh, uh, spectrum of the entanglement structure. So if we cut our system into two halves, um, this tensor network construction allows us to define a state living on the degrees of freedom which we cut here at the boundary. So if we trace out all the rest, we get some mixed state living only on these degrees of freedom, sigma. And this mixed state exactly has the same spectrum as the actual entanglement, as a Schmidt spectrum in a bipartition. And this allows us, for instance, to derive an explicit entanglement Hamiltonian by taking the logarithm of the sigma. And we can again ask, do we see special signatures of a topological order in this entanglement spectrum? And again, the symmetry, the symmetry tells us that there are certain things we will see. For instance, we know that the state sigma, again, must live in the even parity subspace, so it can only use half the Hilbert space, which means there must be a correction to the entropy, which is basically log two or one, basically, for, from a point of view of quantum information, that's one, right? Um, so there will be a correction to the entropy, and that's indeed something which is known to show up in topological systems, and we can really explain it from the fact that it's a symmetry constraint. We can also look at this Hamiltonian, and we will see again that what this Hamiltonian does, it decays into two parts. One part which we can see numerically is local, which is what one would expect, but there's a second term showing up, and the second term is something which doesn't depend on details. It only depends on the class of the topological order we have. And this part, so it's, it's universal, right? It only depends on the phase we're in, not on microscopic details, and it's anomalous. It's some global term. It's something which we can't explain from local physics. It must be backed up by something from the bulk, right? It cannot, it's, it's not one dimensional because it's not local. And this term, again, is showing up from the fact that this is parity constraint. So it relates to this parity constraint. 
And the great thing is that one thing we can see is that this term here, this universal non-local anomalous term, is exactly the same kind of term as the one we see in the actual edge physics when we cut the system. So this really proves why in these kind of systems there is an exact correspondence between edge physics and entanglement spectrum. And that's something which, um, well, relates to this um, edge entanglement correspondence, which was first proposed by Lee and Haldane in the context of fractional quantum Hall effects. And this kind of gives an explicit way of understanding where this comes from in the case of non-chiral topological phases. All right. So, Are you saying that any principle Well, if it has a symmetry of that kind. It's actually a bit more subtle. I will get there in a, in a few minutes. Um, Right, okay, so um, let me now, um, from entanglement, go back to these symmetries and show you an application where this allowed us to study a concrete physical system um, in more detail, and this is about studying topological spin liquids. So what are topological spin liquids? Well, kind of one candidate material is the Heisenberg antiferromagnet on the Kagome lattice here. So, well, it's of twofold interest. First of all, it could be a topological spin liquid. Second, it's believed to be realized very well in this material here, Herbert Smithite where we have magnetic layers um, separated by non-magnetic layers. And the point is that, well, what's special about the Kagome lattice? Well, these spins would like to align in anti-parallel. So you see they can't align in anti-parallel, right? Because we have triangles, they're frustrated. Which means that there's a super high degeneracy of the system. On the other hand, the system would like to order magnetically, but then it can't order because of this frustration. But on the other hand, we have quantum interactions. It's more subtle than just anti-parallel, right? We want singlets. And the idea is that in a topological spin liquid, this kind of magnetic ordering here, the system will not order magnetically, but the strong interactions will lead to some order, but it will be topological order. Now, in order to understand the, the physics of this kind of system, one answer that people have been studying extensively is a so-called resonating valence bond state, which is a superposition of, singlet co of all possible singlet coverings on the lattice, so it puts every black, uh, black, every blue bar is a singlet, and we take a superposition of all these nearest neighbor singlet coverings. Now, it has been widely believed that this is topological, and it's a spin liquid. I should have said spin liquid means there's no spin ordering, right? Topological means there's topological ordering. But the problem with studying these systems is that these singlet configurations are not orthogonal. Different ways of putting these singlet coverings have different overlaps, right? So it's a huge mess to investigate it. What you could do is you could study a kind of toy version of this model, which is where you pretend that all singlet configurations are orthogonal, which is of course not what is the case. So what tensor networks allowed us to do is to basically say, uh, so point one is that this wave function has a tensor network description, but then starting from there, what we could do is we could, we, we, we could start taking this tensor apart and saying, well, what, what is the structure of this tensor? And well, it turns out it has two, two contributions. It has a spin rotation symmetry, right, because it's singlets. And it has a second symmetry, which is of this Z2 type, which is this uh, topological symmetry I explained before, namely for the so-called Tori code model. And actually, there's a relation between the two, because the conservation of spin, one, of, of, of spin indeed implies that integer and half-integer spins must obey such a constraint. Anyway, this construction allows us to separate these two contributions. Coupling is very weird, kind of special spots in this room. Um, so what this allowed us to do is now to, to take this tensor, which has two types of symmetries, right? It has a SU2 symmetry and a topological symmetry, and we could start taking one of them, namely the SU2, the unwanted one in some sense, slowly away, adiabatically away. And because they are parent Hamiltonians, this meant that this also corresponded to change the Hamiltonian smoothly, and in the end, we would be left with something which would only have the topological order and which would be a model which we could solve analytically. And then we could study this numerically, and along this interpolation, we could really track exactly what happens. So anything which stays bounded away from one means there's no divergence. That's, that number to the distance is the decay of correlations. And we, because we understand all symmetries, we can identify the values corresponding to topological sectors, which all behave nicely, but also the one corresponding to spin ordering, and that also behaves nicely, so there's no spin ordering, it's really a spin liquid. And the thing is, the way these tensor network methods work, this doesn't bound a specific correlation function, it's one bound on any kind of correlation function. So it really unambiguously allows us to show that there's an exponential decay of spin ordering, and there's no spin ordering. Whereas with any other method, you really have to pick a specific type of correlation function, spin-spin, compute it, but then you maybe have dimer-dimer, or quadrupole-quadrupole. 
So this really allowed us to make much stronger conclusions about the nature of the state and unambiguously say that this is a topological spin liquid. All right. Okay, so in the last 10 minutes or so, um, let me um, switch topics slightly. Well, I will stick with topological order. But I would like to talk about transitions between topological phases. Oops, okay, let me skip that. So up to now what I told you is that the symmetry is basically equivalent to having topological order in a system. But in fact, it's slightly more subtle. So, well, the coloring scheme changes a bit, but well, each dot is a tensor, right? So in order to model our excitations, what we had is that we would have one of these tensor networks with a symmetry. Then we would put a long string of symmetry operations, which would end somewhere. And actually at the end point, we could put something which doesn't commute with a symmetry like the Pauli X for the Pauli Z, an irreducible representation. So we would have these strings, and I said, well, these describe topological excitations, which is true in principle, but it also depends how I exactly choose these tensors inside the class of symmetric tensors, because I have like an infinitely big tensor network in principle, and this infinitely big network imposes some boundary condition on the string. And well, this boundary condition could be nice, but it could also be a bit strange. For instance, it could be orthogonal to that string, such that if I glue the string into this boundary condition, I get zero. Then, of course, this doesn't describe any excitation. It doesn't describe anything. It could also be that the string is a symmetry of the boundary condition. Then putting a string or not putting a string doesn't make a difference. Then this doesn't describe an excitation. It describes the original state. So it turns out that the whole thing is actually more subtle than I initially claimed. It depends how I tune my parameters. I can tune them so that this is actually orthogonal to the ground state, but I can tune it differently so it, it doesn't describe a proper excitation in one or the other way. And that's what is known as condensation or confinement. So if by putting a string I get my ground state back, it means that what should be this excitation has become part of the ground state, so it has condensed into the ground state. On the other hand, if putting the string gives zero, if the string is very long, it means the only way to get it non-zero is to take the other end point of that string and get it very close. Because then maybe this doesn't happen anymore, so I cannot separate excitations very far. And that would mean that these excitations become confined, they can only show up in pairs. So how can we understand how this happens, or when this happens, or maybe even classify the possible ways in which this can happen? Right, there's a mechanism for topological phase transitions, of course, but how can we understand how this happens? Well, what we have to do is we have to compute expectation values, right? So one thing we have to check is that's an overlap, right? I took a tensor network and put another one on top and, well, do a piece of it. So this has an excitation on one layer. So that's the overlap of the ground state with the excitation. So this should be zero, right? If it's, if it's not zero, it means it's, um, it's not orthogonal, so it's not a proper excitation. This one would be the normalization of this state. This beta shouldn't be zero. So I, I want to know how these two guys behave. Are they zero or are they non-zero? So for this, I can kind of slice a system in this direction and look at the boundary condition imposed from the left and on the right on the system, right? I just come from left infinity until the string and from right infinity until the string. And I get some boundary condition on the left and some boundary condition on the right. And then I have a string sitting here and I want to compute the value the string gives. So what this actually is, in some sense, it's a string order parameter. I haven't talked much about it. Kristen has mentioned it briefly. So this is an irreducible representation of my symmetry group, which is what a normal order parameter is. But I combine it with a string of a symmetry action, and that's what a string order parameter is. So depending on what I put, I get different things. If I only put this, I don't put a string. The string acts trivially. It's a normal order parameter. It will measure symmetry breaking, conventional phases, right? If I also put a symmetry action, it will measure some non-trivial quantum order in the system, symmetry protected order to be precise, which is something which is detected by string order parameters, like in the Holding phase. Now, this, of course, is originally something which is derived for ground states of local Hamiltonians, but the idea is that these systems, if they're gapped, are also short range correlated, so they exhibit very similar physics. So we could use what we know on the classification of those kind of phases and transfer it here and do the same kind of classification of phases under symmetries. And that's actually what we can do. And well, we just get the same as usually. We get symmetry breaking on the one hand, but then if a symmetry is not broken, we can get symmetry protected order, like non-trivial quantum order. There's only one extra ingredient. One ingredient we use is that our states are well, fixed points are short range entangled, but that's the same as for ground sets of local Hamiltonians. They're short range entangled. A second ingredient, these things actually have a cat bra structure because they come from expectation values. 
and they must be positive because they're fixed points of a completely positive map. And that gives a number of extra constraints, and while I won't discuss these, you can ask me later if you want, you get a number of constraints which allow you to fully classify the possible ways in which these anions can condense or confine based basically on the classification of well, symmetry breaking and symmetry protected phases, which is well understood. Okay, so then we can use this, well, one thing is this allows us to set up computable order parameters for topological phases, which is great because, well, topological phases don't have order parameters, but this allows us to set up order parameters which we can measure in simulations, which measure condensation or which measure deconfinement. And then we, we, we did a case study for Z4, let me skip that, but we, we get a very, we got a very rich phase diagram for that system. So um, by, by introducing three parameters, we can start from the full phase, which is characterized by a Z4 symmetry. We have two different Tori code phases. We have what is known as a double semion phase, which, uh, well, is similar to the Tori code, but the statistics is different. And we have a number of trivial phases, and then we can vary parameters and study the phase diagram of the system. And, well, we, we can, for instance, measure along a topological phase transition and order parameter for the condensation and the deconfinement. We, we, we get a number of interesting phase transitions. For instance, along this plane here, if we interpolate along this plane, that's what this cut shows, we get continuously varying critical exponents. So I'm not exactly sure what that is, if anyone has a, so that's a critical exponent beta for the order parameter, which goes from one over eight to uh, 0 0.04 and 0 0.25, depending on which side of the phase transition we check. I'm not exactly sure if that's a known or unknown universality class, so if you've seen something like that, let me know. Okay, we can also look at, for instance, direct transitions between the Tori code phase and the double semion phase, which is something which is of particular interest because it's not described by anion condensation in principle. These phases are kind of, so, so there's some kind of ongoing debate of the, about the order of the phase transition, and we can, for instance, set up different phase transitions, some of which are second order, things behave nicely, some here are first order, so you can actually see that the order parameter makes an abrupt jump as we vary our parameters. So it really allows us to explore this whole phase diagram in quite some detail. All right, and I think with that I'm at the end. Um, so, well, I introduced tensor networks as a way of um, describing quantum many-body systems from the point of view of their entanglement. They, well, one great feature they have is that they give us an explicit meaning to, to the entanglement at the boundary. They give us an actual entanglement space at the boundary. I discussed how topological order can be understood from local symmetries and also how global symmetries can be understood from local symmetries. And well, I explained how this allows us to understand uh, edge boundary correspondence in the sense of Lee Hall Dane in a rigorous way. I showed how this allows us to conclude that the resonating valence bond state is a topological spin liquid. And finally, I discussed how this allows us to, well, classify and also numerically study topological phase transitions in some kind of holographic way through their entanglement properties. Thanks.